Hello. So I'm Colin Chan. I'm on the developer environments team at Meta. I've been there for nine and a bit years, um, which is a long time for Meta. But um, So I'm going to tell you today about just some of the ways we're using the systemd user instance and good and bad things that have come of that. Um, first, I'm just going to give some context about our developer environments, like what I'm, what I'm talking about with developer environments. I'm um, going to look at a particular service that we have that's making heavy use of systemd. Uh, and along the way, I'm just going to talk about like a bunch of different um, uh, sort of challenges we've run into. Some, some as we go through that service, and then, and then just several more kind of miscellaneous things at the end. Uh, and as I go through these things, some of them uh, we've sort of solved, which I'm going to talk about. And there's a couple things that we haven't really solved. And uh, I would be very happy to talk to anybody who has opinions about any of this afterward. So to start with, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the sort of typical development at Meta. Um, a typical software engineer, they are running VS Code on their laptop, and they're connecting to a remote developer environment that's in one of our data centers. Or, or some people don't use VS Code and they just SSH in, like me. Uh, but on the developer environment, there's a bunch of services running. These are machines that are in the Meta data centers, so they have kind of all the standard, like, meta stuff on them, and then we add some stuff on top of that to make them the development environments. Um, there's a bunch of system services running, and then we have users log into them. So we have user instances as well with stuff running inside of them. Uh, and so a lot of, there's, there's a lot of teams within meta that will build a service or something and want to deploy it into our developer environments. And they uh, have a lot of trouble doing that sometimes. Um, we want them to do it inside of the user instance for a bunch of reasons that I'm going to get into. We want them to do it inside of systemd because uh, it takes care of a lot of things sort of out of the box um, and it helps us understand the resource usage of the services better. Uh, but the fact is like a lot of teams at the company, they're not really familiar with systemd, so they kind of like want to lean back on maybe the old way they used to do things. They, their first instinct is like, oh, I'll put some code in. Chef, which we use Chef to manage all the servers at Meta. And so they think, oh, I'll just you know, put some code in Chef to like, run my thing. Um, and, and so their instinct is like, not to go to systemd, and we try to push them that way. Um, so we have two kinds of developer environments right now, it's kind of the older one and the newer one. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but the older ones are mostly VMs, and there's just some different hardware options you can get, uh, and people tend to reserve these for a long period of time. The newer environment, which we call on-demand, um, newer, but we've been using it for six, seven years at this point, uh, it's built on top of containers. It has a very different sort of style. It's much more heavily managed. You pick one based on the specific project or workflow that you're planning to work on, and uh, you, you basically get, you get a machine that is already very set up for you. It already has things up and running and warm so that you can just jump right into development and like, immediately run your build and the caches are hot and stuff. Um, with those newer environments, uh, we, we give them to you for a very short amount of time, uh, 18 hours max usually but they have very good backups and sort of transition to the next one. So you come in the next day, and it's like, oh, your machine expired, but you just click one button, and you're on the new machine with your changes there. So um, it's a pretty good experience for people. One of the challenges my team is facing is we have these two. We're trying to gradually kind of converge them over time. We're trying to provide infrastructure so that when other teams in the company want to deploy their thing into our environments, uh, we're, we're trying to give them a way to do it that will work the same in both of these, which is kind of a challenge because they are fairly different. Uh, so we're leveraging a lot of systemd stuff to do that. This is a high-level overview of kind of the life cycle of these machines. Um, and I'm going to, you don't have to read the whole thing, I'm going to point out specific things. Um, so we, in both, both of these types of environments, we have a pool of them at any given time that are sort of ready to go. Uh, and a engineer will say, I need one of these, uh, and then we'll grab one and assign it to them. That's what's highlighted right now, uh, the place where the machine is just sort of sitting there waiting to be assigned to someone. Um, 
And so on our older style machines, that's basically right at the beginning. Like the machine has been provisioned and it boots up and then at that point it just waits. We don't do any pre-setup on those machines. You just get kind of a blank machine. You're expected to kind of set it up yourself. On the newer style environment, uh, we do set up ahead of time. And, and this poses some interesting challenges because um, we're trying to get the machine as ready as possible before we give to somebody. We don't know who we're giving it to yet, but we need to start some processes as them and things. We do a very strange sounding thing where after we have assigned this machine to someone, we then try to rename the user account to their actual username. And this is because there is a lot of tooling uh, within the company that assumes that the username is meaningful. Uh, so somebody a, a while back was like, oh, what if we just do this? Uh, and um, they, they did it and it, it works. We have run into a very, very small number of problems caused by this. Um, the, way, the way we do it is we put a new entry in the password file that has the same UID but the, the user's username and it means that you, you can look up by UID and get the expected username but you can still look up like the old username and it resolves the same UID. So you would think this, it, it, sounds, it sounds bad but in practice it, it has worked out quite well for us. Um, now I'm highlighting some different things. So these are the sort of relevant steps for if we're deploying a service to one of these machines. Like these are the parts of the lifecycle where we're starting up the systemd instance. Uh, and, and, and so in the first case, like it's very straightforward because we give the machine to the user and then we spin up the stuff. Um, I've also highlighted certs being provisioned. So after the machine is reserved by a user, one of the initial steps is we put some certs on the machine that identifies them and a lot of the tooling at the company relies on those. So that poses a problem. When we're starting some things up, we, a lot of things depend on the certs, so um, we're going to talk more about certs later. But in the case of our newer environments, this, this, uh, the fact that we start the systemd instance early, which is so that we can start services uh, and have them up and running before we give the machine to a user, um, it, it makes some things interesting. So. I'm going to talk about a specific service we have. Um, we have this thing called .sync. Its job is to back up and synchronize your configs and shell history between different machines you log into. This was sort of a natural evolution from an older way we used to do things. We used to have home directories on NFS a long time ago. That was problematic for some reasons. Somebody built this to replace it. Uh, this is what we use now. It works quite well. Um, it's not without its downsides. But um, so the way uh, it's implemented with regard to systemd is we have several different services and timers. We have a service that does this initial downloading of your files. And then we have a service that runs periodically that synchronizes them. So uh, pushing up any changes you've made on that machine and as well as pulling down any changes you maybe have made on other machines that you're using. And we have a service that we want to run right at the end to, to do like a final backup to make sure we don't lose any of your, you know, if you ran some commands right before you got rid of your machine, we want to make sure we save that history for you. And so this is an example of a service that also depends on having that cert identifying the user on the machine. So this is the definition of the initial pull service. Uh, and so what I want to point out here is some interesting things we're doing with the targets. Um, so, so we've basically, we've come to have these two different types of targets. Uh, we have condition targets and dependency targets. That's what we're calling them. Uh, and I'm going to talk about both of those and sort of how we came to that. Um, and so we're using the dependency targets for a service to say, like, I, I need to wait until this dependency is ready. So this service, you'll see at the bottom, when we enable it, we enable it under default.target. Remember, this is in the user instance. So uh, when the user instance starts up, default.target is what gets started. So this service gets pulled in immediately, but it has after on TLS cert.target, and that will delay it starting up until the cert is actually ready. And we have this human.target. I'll explain that a little bit more in a, in a minute. So how did we end up with this dependency target style? Um, the old way that people were doing things, somebody who preceded me had set up this target that was like, 
the cert is fetched. And what you were supposed to do was put that in your install section. You would, if you're writing a service that needed the cert, you would say wanted by TLS cert fetched dot target. And then like the environment would start that target once the cert was there and that would pull in your service. Uh, this seems to have been like easier for people to wrap their heads around, especially like people who are coming into this and less familiar with systemd. Uh, but it did have a bunch of downsides. Um, if you start to have a couple targets like this, uh, what we see is people will figure out that they want their service to start like at this particular time and they'll just attach it to that target, even if that wasn't like necessarily like because they need that dependency. Um, and also a lot of services have more than one of these dependencies, like they depend on not just the certs, but maybe something else. Uh, and if you are doing it in that style, it's not obvious, you can't really declare all of your dependencies nicely. Uh, and also, um, with some of our servers, sometimes they get rebooted and things, and uh, it's less kind of clear how to handle targets like this. So that's how we sort of came to doing this dependency target style of things. Um, uh, our, our advice is to take every service and enable it uh, under default.target and then to add this um, ordering dependency on the, the target for the dependency that you need. Uh, and so this makes it very straightforward to declare all of the things that you actually depend on. Um, and it prevents people from just inserting their service based on the ordering of the targets, which might break if you change the way the environment is initialized later. Uh, and the downsides, this is hard to debug. Uh, if your service is waiting on a target to start, it's confusing and I have some examples of that later. Uh, and we also had to do this thing that you saw on the previous slide. We have this human.target. I'm going to explain that uh, on the right after this. <laughs> this is just how the dependency target is implemented. It's pretty straightforward. There is a service that just waits for the cert to show up. Uh, and, and we depend on that. This is, based, this is like the same way that if you've looked at uh, network online.target that comes with systemd, it's basically just like this. It's a little bit different because they allow the waiting service to be provided by whatever your network implementation is, whereas we just have this one implementation always. Okay, so the human.target thing. So this, is in, so this is an example of what we're calling a condition target. The reason we have this is uh, we have, if you recall earlier, I was showing you the two types of environments. The older environments, they are multi-users. So we often have uh, machines that have several people logging into them. Uh, and so generally we want the systemd set up to work for all of those people. Uh, we don't know who the people are gonna be, be ahead of time. Um, so we want to enable all of these units that are for the user instance. We wanna enable them for all users. But then we actually don't want them running when someone logs in as root. There's also a couple like sort of automation users within the company that exists. Um, and so, so generally, like, we don't want these things running for all those. We only want them running for the people who are actual humans. Um, and systemd does have a condition. There's conditions we potentially could use. There's like a, even a, a system thing. So you can say, I don't want my thing to run for system users. But unfortunately, there's a lot of legacy stuff at our company. And uh, there's a bunch of users that are not system users, according to systemd. But we don't want the stuff running for them. Uh, I did make a note, like potentially we could look at replacing this with a group if we have, uh, if we could get all of our human users into a particular Unix group, we could do a condition group check on it. Maybe, I haven't looked into that yet, but this, this works. Also, I'm gonna later talk about why we had to set default dependencies equals no here. Um, Okay, so now we're gonna move a little bit more into the section of just me talking about some of the challenges we've run into. Uh, I put this quote, it's just, this quote is kind of indicative of often uh, other teams at the company who are trying to deploy their stuff. They don't know anything about systemd. They haven't had to work with it before, so I just thought this quote was like a good example of that. Um, somebody is asking, what language is the service file written in? And is there documentation? And they didn't even realize that this is like a big open source project, right? So. Um, so we have to help them with that. Um, 
So I'm going to walk you through. This is a struggle that I see people run into frequently because so we've we've maybe guided them. So we have a lot of documentation. We've maybe guided them into using a user service to deploy their thing. And then they're just trying to test it. Like they're, they're following our guide. They're trying to test to make sure it works. And the first thing they do is uh, they're logging into one of our machines as root. This is pretty normal for, for like debugging something. And they try to run systemctl status on their service. And it just says, I don't know what you're talking about. Because they don't realize that this is talking to the system instance and not the user one. So they figure that out. Uh, and then they try to do this. And it just is like, oh, your service isn't running. And they don't realize that this is talking to roots user instance, but they actually want to be talking to the one for like the, the, um, the primary user that's on the box. Uh, <laughs> so we have a shortcut for them. Uh, we set up the shortcut called SCU, short for system CTL user, but it like goes to the primary owner on the machine, their user instance. So this is a shortcut to make debugging easier. So once they've you know, read our documentation correctly and understand that this is what they should do, they may find out still their service isn't running yet, and that's because the dependency that they're waiting on isn't there yet. So this is what they would actually have to do to figure out what's going on. They have to run list jobs. Uh, and this now shows that there is a start job for their service, but it is blocked uh, waiting on the cert target. So like once they manage to get here, then it's pretty clear what's going on. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's a lot of steps to get there. Um, it would, I, I made a couple notes at the bottom, like it would be a, a, a bit good shortcut if system CTL status could notice that there was a start job waiting for something and like at least mention it. Um, and then also we found that the wording here confuses people when it says blocking job, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> so I <laughs> made a note there. I don't know if uh, we can change that wording, but um, yeah. Okay. So we we are heavily relying on some internal documentation that we have to help people try to figure out this stuff. Um, but the like the biggest problem that I have with that is it's hard to get people to find the documentation in the first place. So discoverability is hard. Um, but once 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 they realize that we have this internal doc documentation, then they're pretty good. Um, and you saw this sort of, but we have shipped a bunch of shortcuts on our machines just to assist with debugging. Um, we have little wrapper scripts that just make it a little bit easier to like run system CTL and talk to a specific user's instance. Uh, and then one other challenge is um, some of our machines are using storage volatile for the journal for reasons that I don't want to get into. Uh, not something that my team really has anything to do with. Uh, but the end result of that is that if you want to look at logs for a user unit, you have to do this really ugly journal CTL command. You have to filter on the UID and systemd user unit yourself. You can't do journal CTL dash dash user because uh, when you have storage equals volatile, the journal isn't split by user. So, uh, And then the last thing I put on this slide, um, we prefer people to get a shell through machine CTL because that goes through systemd, but everybody already has like in their head like, oh, I'm just going to do sudo dash i or whatever. And that's less good when they're debugging their thing because they don't get quite the same environment that they get when they go through systemd. So. Uh, this is just a big list of common kind of trouble people have when they're writing services. Um, so a lot of it is just they're not, they weren't familiar with systemd. Uh, so they have to learn that, oh, systemd is not going to let processes survive past the end of the service executing. Uh, and they have to like wrap their head around units being enabled by symlinks on the disk. And uh, often I see people try to put some like important information about what their service does in description. So we have like general advice and we say, like, if you wanted to put it in description, don't just change the name of your service, you know? Uh, <laughs> and then also, for some reason, people seem to default to like they, they realize that on a system service they could say user equals, and so they try to set up a templated system service where they're setting the user uh, when we really would prefer them to make it a user service. Um, and then also people seem to find standard output settings and they want to use this to write their log file, uh, but then they're not sure like where to put the log file that, a use, that like all the users can write to, and so um, we're like, oh, you should use logs directory. Uh, but then 
it's very difficult or maybe impossible to use that with standard output because it just, you don't have the path available to you when you're setting standard output. I think it sets an environment variable, but I don't think there's a, I might, I might need to look into that again. Yeah. Oh, and bottom bullet point, you can see I reordered some slides because we already talked about the debugging. Uh, so last thing I'll run through here. Um, this is like a, it, we wrote a timer like this. So this is the dotsing service I told you about earlier. And we're like, we didn't want the timer to start until after we had done the initial setup thing. So we wrote this and this causes an ordering cycle when the user instance starts up. And so this is just like, it's surprising. Um, but it happens because of default dependencies that things have. And so the way we ended up solving it was we did this. We turned off default dependencies and then we manually added back shutdown.target dependencies. Um, there, the other way, we, we, we could have also equivalently done this on the service that we're ordering after, um, but we've run into this with like a couple different services, uh, a couple different timers, I mean, and so we just have like this general advice now. I made like a documentation page about it. Uh, and so we have this block like copied into a bunch of timers now. Um, just something. And one other silly little thing we ran into, uh, this service is stopped and it says it was killed, but there's a bunch of processes in the C group. And I couldn't figure out why this was happening for a while. Um, it turns out that that is a set UID binary and runs as root and we can't signal it from the user instance. So this one is unsolved. I don't know what to do about this. I think we may just have to stop using set UID. <laughs> yeah, that's hard, that's hard. It's gonna take a while, that, yeah. Um, uh, this is the last slide I have. This is a, so this is also related to dots and crew we're talking about. We actually want to run this service while the instance is shutting down. This took a lot of trial and error to figure out all the things we needed. The reason we want to run it while it's shutting down is we want to make sure that nothing else is going to start up because we're trying to get like the final uh, version of the user's shell history. So we also need to like make sure that all of their shell processes exit first. So we wrote a service terminate user shells that make sure all the shell processes go away to make sure that they've flushed their history to disk. Uh, and then we want to run after that. And so we had to do similar things here with turning off default dependencies and stuff so that we could actually correctly run during, during the shutdown. Um, we couldn't use any of those targets I mentioned earlier. We had to do exec conditions instead because we couldn't pull in those things you know, while, while shutdown is happening. So, that was like just a, a very fast through a bunch of stuff. Um, my general conclusions are like system D is great. It's helping us with a, in a lot of ways, but it also is very confusing to a lot of people. Um, and so we're like, we're kind of doing the best we can with documentation and trying to help people find it. Yeah. Thank you. Questions? Yes. You mentioned you have a SCU alias for finding the user units. How do you resolve from the root user to the actual user that the person logged in is? So um, <clears throat> what that alias does is it basically, we, we, we have a file on the disk that says who the owner of the machine is, like who the primary owner of the machine is. So that alias is just reading that file to get the username and then it's talking to that. Yeah. Um, does that so uh, yeah. So for um, the log director, there should be a specifier, I think, that points you to the XDG something something for user instances. I'll have to check again. But, I mean, if, if not, we should add it because we had, well, I'm sure we have, we have it for a few things. Maybe not that one. Okay. Uh, what was the question here? Are you familiar with the, the concept of supervision trees? No. So, like, you have a like you have parent processes and those parent processes have child processes and those child processes have their own child processes. So it's like, you know, it's like the dependencies that you have in, in services and system D. One behavior I, I like to be able to enforce is say a child process goes down and needs to be restarted. Um, I, I also like the parent process to get killed and get 
restarted before the child process is restarted? Have, have you ever had the need to do anything like that? And do you, do you know how to get system D to do it? I have not had that particular situation, no. Um, <laughs> maybe the key mode, but I'm not sure you can, no, I don't, I don't think we have a functionality for that. Uh, off the top of my head, I cannot think uh, of something like that, no. I might be wrong, though. I don't use that stuff that much. Um, any other questions? On the topic of documentation, yes, we need more, obvi always more. So Red Hat has a bunch of introduction to systemd for mm. admins. Have you tried to share those with your users? I have not. Um, generally, the thing is, often they feel like they shouldn't have to learn systemd just to get their right. service on our environment. So yeah. <laughs> we're trying to give them kind of the minimal that they need to. No, but them. I mean, we need up-to-date documentation and a lot of stuff, but I just mentioned it because they have a lot of good series on this stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, we always need more, yes. Any other question? And yes, kill your set ready binaries. I mean, what? <laughs> just, what? Kill them, now! <laughs> okay, going once, going twice. Thank you. <laughs>